Welcome to everyone to this program of the uh, Asia Society of Northern California. Uh, as uh, Margaret mentioned, uh, the topic is Abe's legacy, the future of U.S. Japan relations and the Quad. Uh, we have with us a, a very um, special guest, uh, Dr. Sheila Smith, who is the John E. Merrow Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific uh, Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, one of America's foremost scholars on uh, Japanese politics and foreign policy. She's uh, authored a number of books, including most recently, Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power. Uh, we've been friends for a number of years, but we share the honor of being uh, students of uh, Jerry Curtis, uh, Emeritus Professor at Columbia University, probably the Dean of uh, Post-War uh, American Specialist on Japanese Politics. So with that uh, short introduction, I'd like to jump right into the topic. And uh, I think we'll start with Abe's legacy. Um, so Sheila, being here in Japan since uh, the end of June, uh, about a week before the pri former prime minister was assassinated, um, it's been quite noticeable that there have been really many, many tributes that have been sent and written and uh, spoken about the former prime minister. And um, one of the interesting th things is not only the number of tributes, but also the variety and the diversity. And uh, on the one hand, there are many who are really kind of revere and praise the former prime minister, others who uh, kind of resented and reviled the prime minister. Um, so first of all, maybe I could ask you, uh, what, what, how do you account for the fact that there is such a diversity of views about Mr. Abe? And also, uh, what is your own personal assessment of uh, his legacy? Well, thank you, Glenn. It's wonderful to be with you. And, and thank you for that lo lovely introduction. I also want to thank the Asia Society uh, of Northern California for inviting me to join you. Um, so this is a this is a hard one. Who is Mr. Abe and who likes him and who doesn't? It's a very complex uh, political history. The, the the former prime minister, of course, um, comes from a, a long line of distinguished politicians. His grandfather, very well known Kishi Nobusuke, was the man who renegotiated the U.S. Japan Security Treaty in the late fifties, but also had been uh, indicted as a war criminal in the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals. Uh, so this is a family that has really walked through post-war Japan in many ways in, in, in political leadership positions. Abe himself, I think we, we use two ways of describing him. One is Abe the ideologue. Uh, he, he was never shy uh, about his more revisionist perspectives on history. Uh, he was not at all uh, concerned about calling himself a Japanese nationalist. Uh, although he had a definition of national nationalism that some would find quite benign. Um, and, and he was also somebody that we saw, we, the collective political watchers, saw as uh, somebody that we didn't think was going to come back into political office. He had a, a first term in office in 2006 to 2007. Uh, he was the youngest prime minister at the time at 52. Uh, and he was the the first post-prime minister born in the post-war period. So lots of princeling drama when he came into office, but it wasn't a terribly successful year for him, nor for the his cabinet, nor for the LDP, for that matter. Um, so I didn't think he was coming back, but he did. Uh, he came back in 2012 after the opposition had been in power. And really, I think during that time, consolidated not only the LDP's position again in Japanese politics, but also really became the voice of Japan on the global stage. And so I think the legacy here for him that we're hearing, especially the positive remarks about Abe, really come from his role as statesman, his role on the global stage, his ability to manage the United States from his divergent leaders as Obama and Trump, um, and from you know giving voice in some way to Japanese interests in trade, in security while still maintaining that cornerstone of the alliance with us. Um, let me stop there because there's a lot we can get into, but there's a domestic side to Abe as well that perhaps you are hearing more about because you're sitting in Tokyo. Sure. No, I think I agree with you that uh, the foreign tributes have been almost uniformly positive, uh, right. but within Japan, it, I mean, many people say that he uh, has been, uh, was the most polarizing <laughs> prime minister in recent years. And uh, so, as you say, uh, one, one of the interesting comments I've heard recently by a Japanese commentator is that Mr. Abe, the person, was a nationalist. Mr. Abe, the prime minister, was a pragmatist. Yeah. And I think that kind of, you know, sums up. Uh, yeah. But, you know, one, one anecdote I can't, um, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention is that uh, I found it really interesting that uh, on the one hand, when Steve Bannon visited Japan a few years ago, 
Uh, mm -hmm. He said, uh, Prime Minister Abe is Trump before Trump. He's the most <laughs> nationalistic, you know, leader we can you know, have. On the other hand, John Eikenberry at yeah. uh, Princeton, you know, pretty much a, a, a liberal international order type, yes. uh, has uh, said that uh, this is during the Trump administration. He said, right. well, now that uh, President Trump has taken the U.S. out of world affairs, we have to rely on Angela Merkel in Germany and Shinzo Abe in Japan to lead the right. liberal international order. So right. I think, uh, as you say, he was able to kind of satisfy uh, kind of both sides, which was really right. quite remarkable. Yeah. So w would you like to talk a little bit about the domestic uh, legacy? Sure. So the, on the domestic side, and, and many of our, our listeners are probably aware of this, but in the post-war period, of course, nationalism was not was frowned upon in, in Japan. It was a, it was very largely associated, especially the revisionist nationalism that Abe and his grandfather were particularly uh, assigned the, the, the role of is, you know, this is something that had echoes of the pre-war period. This is a Japan that was not going to be apologetic about what it had done in the war. And uh, this is a Japan where... Yasukuni shrine visits were were legitimized, and so Abe, for many people inside Japan, uh, was anathema, and especially on the on the left liberal side of the political spectrum in Japan, um, who didn't many people who didn't see that side of Japanese history as being to Japan's credit or honor. Um, there was a lot of worry also when Abe came back into office. The, the, there was that the relationship with China would be damaged, or that the relationship with South Korea would be damaged. I think here you, despite the worry and the criticism, you still have to give Abe credit in the way that we give Nixon credit for going to China. You know, he because Abe had the right covered with his own supporters, he could in fact do some of the political bending in, in, in trying to figure out the right course or the right diplomatic compromise with Xi Jinping or with Park Geun-hye, President Park Geun-hye in, in Seoul. So Abe could do things I think that many other prime ministers may have had a hard time trying to do. Nonetheless, I think the domestic critics were also looking at eight years of Abe cabinets, you know, eight years of his tenure in office and seeing what, what you know, corruption, political scandals, uh, bureaucrats sort of doing the prime minister's bidding, whether the prime minister actually bid them to do it or not. So they, there was a kind of uh, Abe fatigue, it was the word that we often heard of in Tokyo, uh, that was coming out of not necessarily ideological critics, but people who thought, okay, he's been around a long time. It may be time for a change. Uh, and so you, you heard that kind of grumbling as well. Uh, I think the circumstances of his death, Glenn, are, 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 will, are tempering some of the worst criticism. A lot of these criticisms, of course, came out while he was in office in prime, you know, in real time. The tragedy or the way the circumstances of his death, I think, have tempered some of the criticism that you might have heard uh, about Abe had he lived on to a, a ripe old age and had gone back to advocating some of the ideas that he felt comfortable advocating for. Um, and I think that, that is the tragedy, I think, that many people in Japan feel, despite the fact that Abe was a controversial figure. Right. Well, the, um, the shooting was really a, a shocking event in Japan. Uh, in large part because Japan has one of the strictest gun control laws in the world. And so, uh, but the assassin uh, had to make his own pistol. He, he, he couldn't buy it, so he had to make yeah. it. Um, but, um, but there are two fallouts uh, from the, the death that, um, is, uh, that are receiving a lot of attention in Japan. Um, and uh, I'll just mention them. We don't have to talk about them. But one is that on the front page of the newspapers uh, yesterday and today and, and on television is, is this whole issue of religion. And mm -hmm. politics, because the assassin uh, reportedly has told the police that it wasn't necessarily because of Mr. Abe's political ideology or, or even you know actions. It was more that uh, his mother had suffered from the Unification Church, which he thought that Mr. Abe and, and others in LDP were supporting. And it turns out more and more information is coming out about the links between the Unification Church and its affiliates and the LDP and actually some other political parties as well. So this is really a, a major kind of un unexpected event that just for the uh, the uh, for the sake of for to let the audience to flag it for the audience, this will be an ongoing issue. And then the second thing is that because his death was such a sudden and surprising issue, uh, the issue of uh, who's going to take up the Abe faction, which is like 97 members. And you know, Abe was, I think, expecting to stick around for at least another 20 or 30 years yeah. uh, to have influence. And so do you have any thoughts about that second issue about uh, the yeah. 
going to kind of take this up. There have been, you know, Hagyuda and Noya right. uh, and, and uh, yeah. you know, five people mentioned as a potential successor. <laughs> yeah. So just on, on that first point on the religion and politics, you know, there's a really nice essay I want to flag for people. I don't know if you've seen it, Glenn, in The New Yorker by Hiroko Yoda. Oh, and yeah. it's really well written, but it also it, 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 it helps you understand this word religion in the Japanese context, right? And I think what's really come up is not religion in the meta, but the kind of new religions, uh -huh. the kind of more mass-based religions that the Unification Church is, you know, obviously the the being demonized here um, because of the nature of the assassin's mother's donations to the church. Um, but I think it's a really, if people are interested in this larger question of religion and politics, I really would like you to read the New Yorker article because it's really well done. On the second issue on the factional politics, though, I think this is going to, this is kind of fascinating, especially, and I know we're going to talk about this a little later in our conversation, but if we start to think about primary Minister Kishida and his future, right? What, what's ahead of him? Um, but just a, the faction itself, you know, you've got four or five contenders for leadership. There was no successor to Abe that was obvious in that very large faction. And as you pointed out, it's the largest in the LDP. Um, that's a lot of political power to wield. And the fact that they can't, you know, they can't coalesce around one person suggests that the faction is got stresses and strains internally that if, if they persist, could weaken it to the point that it could separate. There's two strains, the Abe family strain and the Fukuda family strain inside that, that faction historically. They don't see eye to eye on some fairly significant issues. So you could see that. Um, but you could also just, you know, as you noted, Abe was settling into his role as factional leader as the kind of kingmaker of the LDP. The future leadership of the party would have to have his blessing or it wasn't going to happen, right? So whoever wanted to be prime minister really was going to have to deal with Abe uh, and his faction. And that is that power now is going to be wielded by collective leadership, which means it's not as strongly, you know, going to be playing that kind of role. And also, unless they really come, they really settle around somebody pretty soon. Uh, the faction, um, I think, is going to lose a little, a lot of ground to Aso, Aso Taro, another former prime minister who has a, a, also a considerable faction. But for Kishida, I think this is a challenge because having one leader could be intimidating, but having multiple leaders is complicated. Right. <laughs> Yeah, because true. he's yeah. going to have to think about party unity and he's already come out to talk about, you know, as he thinks about party positions, you know, leadership right. positions, as he thinks about his cabinet, which is all both of which he's going to announce at the end of this of August. Um, he wants he's calling for unity of the LDP, but must, must we must have unity. And if that faction starts to get wobbly, that could be uh, quite difficult to, to achieve. Right. So, you know, immediately after the death of Mr. Abe, some commentators were saying, well, this kind of uh, gives Abe, uh, Mr. Kishida more room to move because he doesn't always have to look over his shoulder uh, about what Mr. Abe uh, would like. Uh, on the other hand, though, it becomes yeah. increasingly clear that uh, at least with Abe there, Kishida had someone that he could negotiate with. And once Abe agreed, he could pretty much hold, right. you know, his his faction. Right. But with Abe gone, as you say, with multiple leadership, it's going to be more difficult for Mr. Kishida to talk to one person and cut a deal. And so exactly. it makes yeah. it more difficult for him in many ways. It, 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 could, it could go either way. And if he settles on one or two people in that collective leadership, right, if he favors one or two, then he is, by definition, making an enemy out of the others, right? right. The other piece of that factional um, dynamic is, and again, this goes back to Abe's ideological positions on things like military spending on Yaskuni, on imperial succession. There's a whole basket of issues identified with the more right or nationalist section of not everybody in that in that faction aligns that way, but there are some people who have come to the fore. I'm thinking here of Takaichi Sanai, um, large voices, maybe not politically powerful, but certainly as people that Abe had designated as new voices on that side of the of the politics within the party. I think Abe had that, an ability to temper those voices. So negotiating with Kishida, as you pointed out, but also could pull back if he saw pragmatic reasons to pull back on some of those more, uh, you know, 
strident kinds of, of uh, right-wing ideas. So you've lost two kinds of controls here, I think. One is control over the faction, and one is no doubt that Abe was the leader of the right in the ideology in the party, and he could right. use or not use it as he chose, right? Well, Mr. Abe is such a fascinating person that we yeah. could talk for another hour about him. Yes, but we could. <laughs> topic, which is the, the current state of U.S.-Japan relations. Uh, um, you, you, it's been a year and a half into the Biden administration. And um, uh, in May, two months ago, uh, President Biden came to Japan on his first yes. trip to Japan, met with you know, Prime Minister Kishida and also had the quad meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so he arrived on the 22nd of May, uh, left on the 24th. I had a chance to see him briefly here. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, overall, the trip seemed to go quite well. But wh okay. what is your assessment a year and a half into the Biden administration with regard to U.S. Japan relations? And uh, what major changes or continuities do you see with the previous Trump administration? So, uh, I, I, you know, it, sitting in Washington, it's really it's it's kind of easy to say, oh, the alliance is really strong. <laughs> The alliance is in great shape. Um, but in, in fact, I think it is. Um, and I think it's two factors there. One is, of course, the Biden administration came in with a, in a embracing what was largely Mr. Abe's idea of an Indo-Pacific framing for the region. Um, and uh, as one senior diplomat told me, he said, it's not doesn't that 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 framing is doesn't belong to Trump. That framing belongs to us. We have the copyright. <laughs> and so you didn't have an administration coming in and throwing out, you know, what the previous administration had been doing on that part of the world. And so they doubled down and they doubled down in a direction the Japanese were very, very happy about because it was very consonant with what Japanese interests were as well. So I think from there, there was the movement of the quad to the leaders level. So a much more highlight, high dialogue with the quad. But on the alliance, there was also uh, very quickly, and I think you were in town here at that point, but the two plus two meeting that came out of the first two plus two was when our Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State went to Tokyo and then to Seoul afterwards. But that two plus two meeting, if you read the statements that came out, was very sharp on China. And so for me, who's you know, watching Japanese strategic thinking, but also watching the China relationship a little bit in my work, um, it was for me the first time there was really kind of a strategic convergence on China. We, we've often been slightly out of sync on China, <laughs> or at least our rhetoric has may have been slightly out of, of sync, but we, we are not now. And much of that has to do, of course, with Chinese behavior. But I, I think in not about Biden's politics, but I, I think it's really a time when the alliance is really it's not we're not arguing over what our priorities are. We, we know what they are. The question is, how fast and furious can we move in the direction of trying to address them? So I think it's in that sense we're in good shape. The, the challenge, I think, um, is the problems are large <laughs> and complex and not without a great deal of risk. And so, you know, we can talk about specifics. I'll just line up a couple of things that I see. But um, we're on the verge of Japan making a fairly significant decision about whether to invest in what they call counter-strike or retaliatory cap military capability. That will have significant consequences, positive, if you think the military balance will be better served by it, but it will also stimulate reaction, I think, in both South Korea and in China. Um, so there's that. The, the other issues, I think, is uh, Taiwan, clearly. Uh, you know, we, we're sitting here in Washington watching the debate about whether our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is going to go. And the Chinese are threatening severe reactions. And our military joint chief is saying we will accompany the speaker if necessary. You know, the rhetoric is ratcheting up. And, you know, President Biden is going to have a phone call with President Xi tomorrow uh, because of the worry about the instability in the relationship that is that is uh, pretty obvious in the military realm. Um, and then there's the larger just economic, and this is this is. I'm not going to just call it just ec economic, but but economic security. Let's put it in the bucket of the strategic focal focal point for economic cooperation between Japan and the United States. You know, we we nowadays supply chain resilience. How do we innovate for the what former Prime Minister Suga called the post 5G era? How do we do that together without? you know, ceding the lead to China. How do we get others on board, the Europeans, others in Asia? Um, there's a whole agenda here under this rubric of economic security that is quite complex and difficult. It's a heavy lift. Um, and so that also is on the agenda for the U.S. and Japan. In fact, the two plus two, there's a new 
two plus two meeting um, and it's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to happen this week. And so the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce are going to take the leads on our side and the METI minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs on the Japanese side. So this is this is reflective, I think, of this new emphasis on not necessarily decoupling, but at least rethinking the strategic value of economic cooperation between the United States and Japan, along with others. So, so it's a pretty complex agenda. Mm-hmm. Even if our convergence is strong, the implementation right. is hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me take you back to Taiwan, uh, because uh, you know, a lot of people noted that when Prime Minister Suga visited Washington in April last year, Mm-hmm. It was the first time in decades that uh, you know Taiwan had been mentioned in a U.S. Japan joint communique. Right. I think last time was Sato and Nixon. Yes, it was. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, uh, on Taiwan, my sense is that uh, certainly the rhetoric in Japan is different from say five years ago, mm-hmm. and also within the United States, there seems to be a lot more expectation that Japan is going to take a more aggressive stance and more active stance. Uh, if there's some emergency in Taiwan. Um, But, um, you know, I I keep hearing different views about this in Japan. You know, some saying, well, this is just the, you know, conservative uh, elements of the LDP who are kind of rattling their saber. Uh, On the other hand, people saying, no, actually, things are, you know, significantly different now. And uh, as uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe said, you know, some Emergency in Taiwan is actually emergency for the for emergency for Japan as well, and so uh, w- what is your sense about uh, Japan's um, readiness to take action on Taiwan? Mm. So the alliance is you know since the two plus two that first two plus two with the Biden administration and then the the Suga cabinet um, the conversation has been you know, quietly moving along in, inside between our two governments. Um, the challenge is going to be, you know, we, we have a lot of crisis preparations that we did in response to the tension between Japan and China over the Senkaku Islands, or the Jiaoyu as the Chinese refer to them. And so we put in um, an alliance uh, coordination mechanism. We created this crisis management mechanism. Uh, and this was largely to alert us to gray zone activity, activity that was pre-conflict, pre-use of force, right? But something that might inevitably, uh, through mistakes or miscalculation or just accidents by commanders on the scene, lead us into conflict, right? So it was not necessarily designed to ratchet us up, but it was designed to manage crises to keep them from escalating. And that's where the alliance was uh, at the point at which, you know, the the, the Trump administration came in and, um, The rhetoric, not only, you know, of China's rhetoric, but our rhetoric and the Japanese rhetoric then began to take hold, right, on this question of Taiwan, um, things began to move. Now, the backdrop is the Chinese behavior, of course. The PLA has been testing the the Taiwanese defenses considerably for several years now. So there's been an uptick in PLA activities, especially in the air. Uh, Not exclusively, but especially in the air. Um, There's been some rhetoric coming out of Beijing that suggests that there may be a time frame, a time limit on when the the, Xi is willing to wait for Taiwan to peacefully rejoin the the mainland. Um, That's never been the rhetoric that we've heard out of China in the past. There has always been this idea we have a lot of time. It's a natural process, right? Um, But rhetoric is the the way in which the Chinese leadership is speaking about Taiwan has also shifted. Um, And then, of course, you've you've had more rhetorical flourish, let's say, (laughs) in the Trump administration when it comes to feelings about China and feelings about Taiwan. So let's leave all that politics side aside. I think the challenge for the alliance is we don't have a Japan that has signed on to active military participation in a Taiwan or a cross straits contingency. Uh, The Korean Peninsula is different. And, you know, the Korean Peninsula has always been the predicate upon which the self-defense force, Japan's post-war military, thought about the way in which Japan might become involved in a war. Um, It led eventually to the guidelines, which is a binational discussion of military, how the two militaries would operate in a crisis or a war. Um, But it was all framed around the contingency, which was the Korean Peninsula. So we don't have that level of detail and planning. We don't have agreement about what bases 
or which bases, which facilities the United States military might use if they have to amp up into a war footing uh, for a cross states contingency. Uh, we don't necessarily have government nod, a Japanese government nod to allowing the United States to use those bases, right, for operations off of of, Jap- of Japan, you know, uh, with third third countries involved. Lots of unknown, not unknowns, but unsettled and undefined pieces to the Taiwan puzzle. I sense, and I sense this from a distance, so I can only speak on the Japanese side to concern about the significantly uh, obvious uptick in Chinese military activity. Mm -hmm. And not just numbers, but qualitatively. Um, And it's obvious the Chinese are practicing or they're demonstrating that they're exercising for the purpose of, right? So signals are being sent between militaries. So the Japanese military is catching these signals as as much as ours. Uh, We've been doing an awful lot of late of pushing back and signaling of our own. A month or so ago, apparently there was a huge... Uh, exercised by the United States, watched carefully by the Air Self Defense Force of Japan with fighter jets in the air that crossed the median line and looked like they were approaching Chinese territory. So pushing back on the PLA. Um, But I I think we're just ratcheting up on both sides. The rhetoric is ratcheting up. The militaries are more tense, more sensitive to each other. And by this, I mean the Chinese and the American militaries. Japan is geographically right there. Um, you know, it's a, a couple of hundred kilometers between Taiwan and the Southwest Islands of Japan, the Okinawa prefecture. If there is a war, let's just go to worst case scenario. If there is an actual conflict inviting, involving the United States and China, Japan will be affected. There's no way it won't be affected either because it's, 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 military operations will will have to be curtailed or because it will become a target because it hosts American bases. So that's the, that's the piece that has to be worked through the alliance is who's going to bear what level of risk in the case of this kind of conflict. And of course, whether or not Japan participates in it and Japan's military in particular participates in it is a political decision that the prime minister will have to make. It's not codified in law or anything like that. It will be a calculation, right? that you're in or you're out. And I think it will determine the future of the alliance one way or the other. So that leads me to my next question, a broader question about what we can expect from Prime Minister Kishida. In the case of Prime Minister Abe, he he was pretty clear. You know, he wanted to revise the constitution. He wanted to get the the FDs back from North Korea. He wanted to uh, retake the Northern Territories from Russia. He wanted to increase uh, defense expenditures uh, and so forth. So it was pretty clear uh, at least Abe had some clear stated priorities. He didn't necessarily ac- accomplish many of those, but but uh, at least he he uh, it was clear what, where he was headed. In the case of Mr. Chida, people say he's a great listener, but nobody really seems to know exactly what his priorities are. And and for instance, you know, with regard to North Korea, or with regard to revising the Constitution, or with regard to China, or Russia. Well, with Russia, I think the U- Ukraine situation is pretty much you know put on freeze for the time being. Anything. Yeah. You know, well, between Japan and Russia. But with regard to these other issues, I mean, to what extent do you see um, continuity and to what extent do you see differences between what we, what uh, Mr. Chida will do as prime minister in terms of his foreign policy and what we saw from uh, Mr. Abe? I mean, Mr. Chida was for more than four years the foreign minister for Mr. Abe. So people, I think, generally assume a certain level of continuity. But, you know, Chida is from the um, Kochikai, you know, which is known, you know, Ikeda, Ohida, Miyazawa to be more kind of moderate with regard to um, China and uh, South Korea, as well as his foreign minister, Mr. Hayashi. So wh- how do you see the um, the foreign policy on the Jap- Japan side shaping up? So I think there's, you know, the the, the challenges that Kishida's going to face are that he can't wish them away. I mean, the world that we all live in, frankly, are, are going to he's going to have to face these choices, one of which was the counter-strike debate. The other is how much to increase the defense budget. These are things that are going to have to be decided, and it's it's going to be on his watch that they're going to be decided. So um, I think in some ways he has a reputation for being a little bit more of the dove. Again, you mentioned Kochikai, which is more moderate in terms of the of the military in particular, but um, but also in terms of foreign policy approach, Kochikai has been very well known for its use of economic instruments, 
it's, you know, emphasis on diplomacy as opposed to using the military instrument, right? So that's an important intellectual dis distinction. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, it, it would be, it, it's not as if Kishida-san can stop the tape and wind it back. I mean, we are where we are where we are, right? And what I thought was really interesting is when he decided to sort of stand up against Suga in the, in the presidential race for the party last year, um, he, he tacked to the right, to, I hate using that kind of language because it's too simplistic, but he did tack. Um, he very early on did a, I think it was Nikkei, I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Nikkei. He did an interview on China that was, so you could have put Mr. Abe there and it wouldn't have sounded much different. And, um, and I think that, again, goes to show that that's the world Japan faces today. Um, and as you noted earlier, Abe was not always ideological when he came to talking about China either. He, he, he was in the process of trying to, to repair ties with Xi. Uh, and so he had his own diplomatic strategy as part of it, as well as his beliefs on Japanese military power. But Kishida tacked on the China question, made it very clear very early on. And he also tacked on the counterstrike issue, which really caught my attention because he came out really early in his bid for the leadership of the party by saying all options are on the table, paraphrasing, of course, <laughs> um, all options are on the table, including counterstrike, retaliatory capability. So he embraced the ongoing debate that was, he didn't shy away from it, but he also, I think, was signaling to the more right inclined, more, more hawkish side of the party that he understood what the stakes were and that's where he was headed. Mm -hmm. As he goes forward, though, and this is what's going to be interesting. You said he didn't have a position on Russia, but I would I would frame it differently. I would say he actually took a pretty st straight on position on Russia, one that yeah. Abe was not willing to take. Um, mm -hmm. And he sided with the G7 after the aggression against Ukraine. And he's basically, be, uh, you know, basically ordered his government to start talking about the territorial dispute with Russia. And so he he threw down the gauntlet in a way. Uh, very quickly after the aggression against Ukraine and sided with what he called the rules-based order. So on right. the side of, you know... A lot of people were very impressed with that. I mean, he, yeah. he much more decisively yes. than they might have expected. So, yeah. so I think if you listen to Kishida, he actually is telling us his, his thought process, yeah. right? Now, what he can accomplish remains to be seen, especially on the defense, because, you know... 2% of GDP is probably aspirational. Let's put it that way. Um, right. How far he's willing to go on counter-strike. Is he really willing to go that far or how is he going to balance other arguments? I don't know. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that he's following the Indo the free and open Indo-Pacific doctrine, which was of course formed under Abe. Uh, he's siding with the G7 uh, very clearly without hesitation and far more forcefully, you know, for example, uh, the Japanese sent uh, military gear to Ukraine, to the oh, defense right. forces of Ukraine, yep. right? And it wasn't lethal weapons. You know, no, no Japanese weaponry was sent. But, yep. you know, helmets and flak jackets and medical equipment. And that apparently came right out of the prime minister's office. That didn't bubble up from the Ministry of Defense. In fact, the Ministry of Defense were like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> and they were waiting for the brouhaha in the diet. No yeah. brouhaha came. So Kishida's instincts, I think, have been actually quite straight on and quite clear. Um, the only other relationship I would say we have to wait and see is North Korea. We're all sort of thinking there's a nuclear test perhaps in the making. Right. Um, Kishida may not have the kind of political clout with the abductee families that Abe had, the credibility that Abe had for watching for their interests. I don't think he's going to move away from that position, but if we get into a conversation about North Korea, he'll have to make a very you know, he'll have to tread perhaps on political ground that he may not be, I, I don't know yet, which, how he's going to manage that. So that's how I would leave that. Okay. So before I, I switch to the U.S. side of the equation, um, yeah. one, one kind of footnote, uh, South Korea, you did mention South Korea. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> with regard to South Korea, my impression is that the U.S. administration, the, the South Korean administration are both very optimistic about making progress between Japan and South Korea. Um, especially with the change of leadership in all three countries within the last year or so. Um, uh, and then some people will say that Mr. Chida and Mr. Hayashi are tend, tend to be less ideological than their predecessors, and therefore some kind of uh, accommodation, uh, improvement relations might be expected. On the other hand, you know, some people will say 
Well, Mr. Kishida was a foreign minister when he concluded the Comfort Women Agreement in December of 2015, which the South Koreans uh, basically reneged on the following year with a new administration. And uh, therefore, he feels personally kind of stubbed by that. And also the mood in Japan uh, has been so soured and so um, burned by what they consider to be the moving goalpost on the South Korean side. And so the many people in Japan say, well, this is a problem South Koreans created. Uh, whether it's the uh, the abrogation of the Comfort Women Agreement or whether it's the uh, the court decision on uh, forced labor. So since they created the problem, they need to solve it, is <laughs> is kind of the many people I talk with in Japan say. On the other hand, the South Koreans say, well, you know, we're, we want to reach accommodation, we want to reach a settlement, but, you know, Japanese have to show good faith too. And some Japanese are kind of offended by that. So what, what is your sense, sense of what, uh, how, we can, how much we can expect for improvement in the South Korea-Japan relationship? So I think from what I've seen, so I, I, I can't pretend to know what Prime Minister Kishida is thinking, right, about what he's going to do going ahead or what uh, Hayashi, uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi is thinking himself. Um, but I, I do think that Kishida was instrumental in the Comfort Women Agreement in 2015. Um, I think Abe could move the political side uh, more effectively than Kishida could have done alone. Uh, so I think it's a, a partnership. I, I think that Abe Kishida partnership is often under, underestimated in terms of how valuable that was to reaching the agreement to begin with. I don't know about you, but I didn't think it was going to happen, you know, and there we were sliding towards New Year's Eve and it was what, December 29th or 28th or something, you know, the phone started ringing. <laughs> Oh my God, you know, so they squeaked it out, right? On both sides, I think the politics were, were rough going. Um, but I think both uh, President Yoon, the new president in Seoul, and Prime Minister Kishida have echoed the same thing. And that is that, that, that dissent and dissension and ill feeling is not in our country's interest, right? We have a, an interest in improved relations. So that's the, that's the floor, and I think you've got that floor. Um, the delegation that got sent over when Yoon was still president elect was very full of people that you and I both know. But the one is now the ambassador uh, to Japan from South Korea, deeply steeped, uh, mm -hmm. you know, PhD from Keio, um, but deeply steeped in Japan and the, and the relationship between South Korea and Japan and the United States. Um, so they have kind of the A team. Park Jing, as you know, is a National Assembly, very highly regarded National Assembly member by both sides of the political spectrum in South Korea, which is a rarity in South Korean politics. So he is also, the foreign minister is also well positioned to start to move the ball should there be a, a way to do it. I think the hurdle, Glenn, is going to be that Supreme Court forced labor issue. Right. Um, and so the hurdle there, I believe, is whether or not... Um, the formula, I think, that has to be, I don't see any other way, and maybe others have more creative thinking than mine, but it is, where I see it is, is the South Korean government trying to figure out with the, the, the plaintiff's lawyers, right, what the settlement needs to be, and then providing it. Yes. Um, the question is whether or not there's going to, that's going to require a Japanese statement, you know, of some sort from the prime minister or the foreign leader, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think the statement is going to be the difficulty. I think the difficult, the initial hurdle is the, that government, South Korean government conversation with the victims, um, the lawyers. Um, I don't see like the, the Japanese diet. <laughs> making a statement of apology or something like that, which is in many minds of many of the NGOs in South Korea, that's what they want. Um, but you, I think a lot of people don't understand that prime ministers, several prime ministers have written letters, have made public statements, including Abe. Mm -hmm. right. You know, every, that comfort woman agreement included personalized letters from the prime minister, from Abe to the victim, uh, uh, signaling remorse and responsibility. So, um, there may be some way in which Kishida will and Hayashi can find a formula that might work, but they're going to need that, that faction that we started out talking about. Right. Right. They're going to need a Sotaro. They're going to need that side of the political balancing act inside the LDP uh, to, to make that a doable. Right. Thing, right. So um, um, I do want to have a final discussion about the quad, uh, but there's a question with regard to the quad. So before getting to that question, discussing the quad, I do want to talk about the U.S. side of the okay. U.S. equation, and that is that 
Um, you know, in previous visits to Japan in recent years, there's been a, I, when I've had discussions with with people uh, about U.S.-Japan relations, often they talk about is uh, Trump better than Biden, Biden better than Trump, Republicans versus Democrats. But this time, the last couple of uh, months, many people in Japan are saying it's not a matter of political parties. It's a matter of the U.S. D- democratic system. Are you people OK? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, there's a real concern expressed uh, with midterms coming up in the United States with the uh, election of 2024 coming up and uh, and uh, with, you know, Mr. Trump uh, yesterday giving us a speech about uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., about coming back in, in, into uh, the White House. Um, you know, th- there is concern about the kind of the continuity and the staying power and the consistency mm-hmm. of the United States. And uh, for, I mean, number one is uh, given the situation in Ukraine, uh, will the U.S. be able to sustain its focus on Asia, number one? And number two, uh, with all the domestic uh, turmoil taking place in the United States and with the midterms and with the, the uh, presidential election, um, can we expect in the Japanese and other allies uh, expect um, consistency, continuity, and um, and you know being able to um, to really focus on on these issues uh, like IPEF, for instance, which the administration is just uh, launching. So how how do you address how do you respond to the Japanese expressed concerns about uh, U.S. democracy and consistency and so forth? So I think there is a concern about where we're headed. And I, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's necessarily about Republicans versus Democrats. I, but all, it, it's about the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. It's about the racial divisions in the country. It's about um, the kind of violence, the gun violence that we're seeing, um, that we're all seeing. I mean, our allies and citizens of our, our allies are watching this as closely, right? Um, and wondering, scratching their heads and saying, what's happened to the United States, right? It's not that, you know, those of us who are Americans, we, we can we can see the history if we take each of these strands, right? But but it does look all cumulatively pulled together. Uh, it, it looks like it's it's it, we are coming apart at the seams. And I I have Japanese who are pretty much on the same page as the people that you're talking to because they they don't understand it and they are afraid of it. They're afraid in the sense that they worry that we have lost our democratic values, that we are no longer the kind of world's longest, you know, sustained democracy, that we are actually going to make democracy, you know, the, the weaknesses of democracy evident by our demise. And I think that that's the kind of language you can hear. And I hear that from my more liberal you know, academic friends, uh, Japanese, as, as I do from more conservative folks as well. So um, it's a little shocking, but it's also worrying if you are Japan that, you know, one of our dear friends, Professor Nakayama, used to say, we don't have a plan B. <laughs> we don't have another option. <laughs> we have you guys. Um, but but I do think, you know, it's coming our kind of, uh, you know, our turmoil and our, you know, partisanship, the inability to come to bipartisan agreement on foreign policy, right, our role in the world um, is coming at exactly the same time when real threat is growing against Japan and where the alliance is absolutely crucial. Um, so I think that that combined tension of, you know, and it's not that we're going to throw them under the bus, but are you going to be able to be there? Not are you willing to be there, but are you going to be able to focus? Are you going to be able to sustain your post-war role, especially as an ally in Article 5 protections? That's a huge concern. And, you know, authoritarianism may not be the right way to think about this, you know, democracy versus authoritarianism. We could have a couple of hours debate on that, but, but watching the Russian invasion of Ukraine has shaken the Japanese and others in in the Indo-Pacific as deeply as it's shaken us and it's shaken, you know, our European allies as well. It's a different world now. Um, You know, we were having a meeting at CFR uh, yesterday with John Lewis Gaddis and Margaret McMillan, two of the great. I I heard that. (laughs) Yeah, two of the great historians, right? And John Lewis Gaddis said, "We okay, the 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 post Cold War era just ended, (laughs) 2022. (laughs) We don't know what's next, but you know that that interim between Cold War and now is." He assigned a lot more more blame to the U.S. than I, I would have expected. The expansion of NATO. Oh, but yeah, yeah. He had an opinion no on that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on the but, I think the Jap- but I think a lot of Japanese see the same thing. And I think especially the foreign policy thinkers that I know in Japan, 
are feeling like we are in this like undefinable moment, right? Undefinable world. And, and so I think that the potential for lots of things to change, including right. us, uh, is what's so worrisome. Yeah. So we have about uh, 15 minutes left and uh, there is a question on the quad that's come sure. in. So um, I think this fits with um, our original plan to, to discuss, uh, to end our, 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 our initial discussion on the quad. So let me read this question and uh, have you address it. Uh, Abe was so influential in how he supported regional economic links, such as the CPTPT, and propelled the region towards his vision to shape the economic and security architecture. Will the quad now adopt a harder edge or framework and support as the four countries profess their steadfast commitment? Additionally, if the quad is to get regional buy-in, especially from other democracies, will Indonesia and South Korea also play a pivotal role in creating a sustainable quad for, for it to truly encompass a broader Asia? So, so this- on, yeah, I, I think I think the the quad idea was something that Abe, Mr. Abe, had even back in two thousand six, two thousand seven. So, but it's always been it. You know, Australia was the weak link, surprisingly, because Australian politics shifted between conservative and, and labor, and they were they were the especially labor, but they were really not interested in anything that looked like containment of China. So Australia was not really up early on for this idea that these four powers could come together and have a common agenda. Um, the U.S. and Japan have always seen it as a possibility and has seen, you know, have looked at it carefully. Japan, I think, has really what we call in political science operationalized that vision. I mean, it has really brought forward the connectivity, both digital and energy and the ideas that underpin what do you mean by the quad and what can what capabilities can the quad bring to the table? I think Japan, you know, Abe-san and his group have a, a lot of um, should get, get a lot of credit for that. But I think, you know, I don't see it in, 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 in moving to a harder edge, as I think your questioner said. I don't think this is ever going to be a Asian NATO. I just I don't see it. And I, that, then I, the reason for that is I focus on India. Uh, India is not interested uh, in the traditional military alliance. And I think there's strands of Indian foreign policy that will never make India willing to embrace that kind of, of arrangement. That being said, maritime security is of concern to all four of those powers. And they all have capabilities, India more expressly in South, you know, in the Indian Ocean, obviously, but it exercises with Vietnam and East Asia. The Quad has just had its first first Quad uh, maritime exercise. So I think you've got building blocks here of collaboration. It doesn't necessarily mean that all four countries will be present all the time doing the same thing. Um, But the large formulation, the agenda that we see coming out of the leader summits since last year have largely been the COVID vaccinations, the provision of public goods, I guess is the best way to put it, providing vaccinations, helping India manufacture vaccinations, right? Um, The provision of discussions about supply chain resilience, right? How are we going to make sure that we offset some of the challenges that Australia had when Beijing decided to impose tariffs as as part of its coercion uh, on the Australians? So diversification, thinking about opportunities for that diversification, rebuilding connectivity so that not everything has to go through China to be built or to be to be bought, right, or distributed. So I think this is a kind of interesting conception. I think it's, it's, we, we have to be watch and see how consistent and persistent I think the leaders of those four countries are going to be. But I think it's got some staying power. Right. I mean, the Australians voted somebody into prime minister's office and then he ran to the airplane to get to that quad meeting in Tokyo. But the last piece of the question is with with others in the region. I think the working group formulation gives lots of latitude for not just South Korea and Indonesia, but for other others in the region, the region to participate, should they find benefit in participating. So I think that working group kind of to do list agenda (laughs) focused quad, I think that idea is very, is very fitting for today's Indo-Pacific in -hmm. terms of the needs of the region, but also in not making it too much of an anti-China cabal. Right, right. So we have another question. Um, the question is, Japan benefited tremendously with the, globaliz- with the globalization and Mr. Abe was ardent supporter of it. Uh, now with the trend of deglobalization, what is the position of the current Japanese leadership? 
So that's a great question. I think I was, you know, when I raised economic security earlier in our conversation, I was really thinking that's where I would put that bucket of issues. I don't think Japan writ large, and remember, we talk about Japan as if it's a unitary actor, but there are lots of interests in Japan. And I would say what the state and the government are currently talking about may not always align with what private sector Japanese leaders are thinking about the way in which they operate in the world. But um, but I think everybody recognizes private sector and public sector that the world is changing quickly and that certain interests now need to be protected in a way that maybe they didn't have to be a decade or so ago. Um, I do think that deglobalization may be too strong of a word to describe what's happening. I think you're starting to see some retrenchment in critical technologies, you see this in the semiconductors, you know, everybody wants a semiconductor producer on their on their national territory, Samsung, TSMC, right? Everybody wants their, their factory. Um, that could end up having competitive dynamics, right? Not necessarily collaborative dynamics. That could certainly end up in a pretty intense co- competition for all the kinds of resources that semiconductor production require. Um, so none of this is simple and straightforward. Um, but I don't think, I think it's risk mitigation is what's going on. I don't think it's necessarily, I wouldn't give that big label of deglobalization. Um, I think everybody is trying to mitigate risk. Uh, and you've got a compounded now with the sanctions against Russia, right? You've got a com- compounded sense, especially uh, among Japanese corporations of that, that risk as well. So I think we just have to try to navigate it. Um, not sure what the end game is. But Japan is going to have to be part of that conversation with Europe, mm-hmm. not just with us, uh, if we're going to, to be satisfied in that we're doing this together and right. we have a collaborative framework. So let me ask you a related question. Maybe this mm-hmm. may be the last question. Um, your assessment of IPEF, <laughs> the indo uh, civic economic framework, which right. uh, has been long awaited, I, I guess right. some people interpret it as the Biden administration's alternative to re- returning yeah. to TPP or CPTPP, yeah. Yeah. Um, or at least a partial response. Right. But uh, so um, being here visiting Japan, I have to say that I've, I've heard a lot of skepticism privately, maybe not, I mean, publicly, I think people are basically praising it as at yeah. least a good first step, but um, not only in Japan, but many other Asian countries, there seems to be considerable skepticism about the efficacy and the results that it can produce, especially given the competition with China. But what's your assessment overall of IPEF? So it's hard to know because it's just getting started. And I think uh, I would just say very straightforwardly, everybody knows we can't go back to CPTPT given the politics in this country. It's not going to happen, at least in the first Biden administration. It's just not going to happen. So but but I think I think what the Biden administration heard were the demand signals coming from Asia that they needed an American economic engagement strategy, not just the hard, not, not just the military side, but they needed an economic engagement. The preference is CPTPP. But if you can't do that, do something. <laughs> and so I think that's what IPEF is. Um, and I, I, you know, again, reality is reality. I think they did the best they could. Um, but I, I, I think what's still tenuous, I was surprised when Biden announced it in Tokyo. I, I wasn't surprised he announced it in Tokyo because Japan has long been inviting this economic engagement, but right. that there was already 13 countries signed up mm-hmm. for discussions. Yeah. And that came out of the ASEAN summit, right? It comes out of the four quad members, right? So then there's other allies, New Zealand, South Korea, but it also came out of the ASEAN summit that was held in Washington the week before Biden went to the region. So, mm-hmm. deeds, so the idea is to engage strongly with the ASEAN countries as well. So I, I give them credit for getting it this far. I think we need more clarity. I think we can't do it without Japan in in terms of that piece of our our, our desire to move forward. Um, And I I take a kind of keep expectations moderate (laughs) or modest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But but in in the end, the engagement, the the issues of conversation in IPEF are important. And so I expect that that's also going to be what keeps people at the table. Okay, we have five minutes left, and there's one final question, uh, and I, I don't think it'll take you a long time to answer this question. So uh, the question is, what was and is the official stand of the U.S. government regarding the revision of Japan's constitution? 
Wow. Well, the United States government doesn't take a position. The, the Washington Post editorial board apparently does. So I don't know if you saw that. I was just flabbergasted. You didn't see it. So it was a couple of weeks ago, the Washington Post editorial board said it was time to legitimize the Japanese military. And I was like, what? <laughs> I wrote a book about that. I, I had a point of view, that editorial, like who, whose business is it of yours? Um, well, I, wonder, I wonder if Fred Hyatt would have written that. <laughs> no, he would not have. I would, I mean, I, I'll conjure up my, you know, my, my, my inner Fred Hyatt. I don't think he ever would have said something like that. Right. So it makes, makes me skeptical. But anyway, sorry, back to the question. The, the, the United States government does not take a position on constitutional amendment because it is up to the Japanese people to decide what to do with their constitution, not the United States government. And so there's been a very careful over the years, you know, we've asked for more defense spending. We've asked for more SDF operational support. We've asked for all kinds of things. But we, the, the formal U.S. government does not have a position on another country's constitution. So um, I, 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 th that was actually one of the things that really f shocked me about the, uh, the Washington Post editorial because it didn't understand the Japanese constitution. You know, there's, there's nothing illegitimate about the Japanese military, um, right? That's not the issue at stake no. here. But, um, but I think there's a contorted kind of way in which people think that any conversation about revision of the constitution is about Article 9. Mm -hmm. And it may very well not be. It may well be about a whole host of other issues. We have a info guide at CFR.org that I created to help people see the history, the politics, mm -hmm. and also how it's changing. And the debate is changing about what are the issues that might need to be, uh, the Constitution may need amendment to be added. Um, things like privacy rights or paying for education, for tertiary education in Japan. There's a whole bunch of things on the, on the agenda among the political parties that don't have to do with Article 9. Right. Okay. Very good. Well, I think uh, we're up to about two minutes, and so I should probably turn it back to Margaret. And thank you, <laughs> Sheila, very much for a very uh, stimulating and informative discussion. Thank you, Glenn. It was lots of fun, as always. Love to do it again.